Okay, so since I, I do a lot of breathing, and I was thinking about when I do a lot of breathing, I do a lot of breathing on my bike, and I can strap a GoPro to my bike, I thought maybe on the bike would be a good time to talk about the thoracic cage and the muscles of respiration and how we breathe. Oh yeah, all right. I think I've got a tailwind as well, which might help. So, got a tailwind, I'm on the flat. My hands are on the tops of the bars, I'm spinning. I'm riding easy. I've got to talk to you guys, which is affecting how I breathe a little bit. But most of my breathing is being done through my diaphragm. My diaphragm, when it's relaxed, is a, is a dome. And when the muscles contract, they flatten. So the diaphragm pulls down and it increases the, the superior, inferior dimension, right? So the volume inside the thorax increases, the pressure decreases, and the air gets drawn into the lungs. I'm trying to breathe a bit more now. Um, and that's the easy way. When we breathe out, the lungs are filled with elastin. They've got loads of elastic material in there. Um, and the diaphragm, of course, uh, the muscles contract and flatten. So when they relax, they go back to a dome. So the muscles relax. The lungs want to shrink because they're full of elastic material. So breathing out is a, a kind of a no energy, relaxing movement. Yeah. And that's, and that's expiration, and this is why we associate expiration with death, expire, because the last thing you do is take that last breath out because everything relaxes. Um, but if I start going a bit harder, I'm starting to breathe a bit more already. My pulse rate's going up, I need more oxygen in, I need to get more CO2 out, and I'm starting to move my thoracic cage more. There's a hill coming up in a bit and I'll move it even more then. So now, not only is the diaphragm not enough to, to pull in the air that I need and push it out, but I need to also pull more air in, so I need to make my thoracic cage volume larger, and I need to push that air out again. So you pull it in and push it out, so you can take the next breath sooner, so you can exchange more gas, more volumes of gas, get more CO2 out, get more O2 in as your muscles are burning energy. So I need to move my thoracic cage. I need to move, and by doing that, I'm gonna move my ribs. So by moving my ribs, I can increase the volume in my thorax even more. Cheers. So on this hill, when I start, ooh, on this hill, when I start making more effort, what I'm gonna do is, uh, and I'm not going to think about this, but my the shape of the rib is curved, but it starts off flat and then curves down anteriorly and inferiorly, and then attaches to the chondral cartilages and attaches to the sternum. And the ribs are all different. The first rib is atypical. It's very different to the next handful of ribs, which come round and attach to the sternum fairly directly, and it's different then to the ribs beneath that and the floating ribs beneath that. And in between all those ribs, in between each pair of ribs, are three layers of muscle. And these three layers of muscle match the three layers of muscle that we see in the abdomen. And the three layers of muscle, not just in being three layers, but in fibre direction and, and all sorts of embryology, see? So, the, uh, the three layers of muscle between the pairs of ribs are the external intercostal muscles, then the internal intercostal muscles, and then the innermost intercostal muscles. And the external intercostal muscle layer, the outermost layer, those fibres run in this direction, an antero-inferior direction. And they, that layer starts from the vertebrae and runs around between the ribs, but they don't run all the way around to the sternum. It, it's, that layer stops just before the rib meets the chondral cartilage. Then it becomes a membrane and carries around to the, the sternum. And what that muscle layer does is, is when it contracts, it pulls the ribs upwards and outwards. And in fact, if you look at how the rib, the head of the rib articulates with the thoracic vertebra, it's more of a, 
it's more of a rotational movement and that rotation lifts the ribs up yeah. so external intercostal muscles will 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 move the ribs a little bit and what happens is if you put your hands on your front and your back and you breathe in and this is a very a movement we're very familiar with the sternum gets lifted upwards and, and outwards so this anteroposterior dimension within the thorax increases which means that the volume of the thorax increases so the pressure decreases and air gets drawn in but also and that's called the pump handle movement so the sternum is kind of moving like a pump handle it's a bit of an old idea the whoa, the the ribs again if you put your hands on your sides and you breathe in your hands get pushed apart because the ribs are getting lifted upwards and outwards so you're increasing this lateral dimension within the thorax increase the lateral dimension of the thorax increase the volume within the thorax decrease the pressure and air gets drawn in and we breathe in so the external intercostal muscles are lifting the ribs up like that the internal intercostal muscles their fibers are running kind of at about 90 degrees to the external intercostal muscle there so they're running supero anteriorly and when those contract they're going to pull the ribs down uh, and force you to <laughs> expire and the innermost intercostal muscle there is arranged similarly so the, ex the internal intercostal muscles they start from the ribs they start from the sternum and run between the ribs but only about as far as the angle of the rib and that's where the posterior flattened part of the rib then starts to descend and curve around so again the internal intercostal muscles don't go all the way around to the um, all the way around from the sternum to the vertebrae they start at the sternum and stop short of the vertebrae so the shape of the rib the direction of the muscle fibers and how far around these muscles go seems to confer these different actions now these aren't the most important actions of the intercostal muscles the most important function of the intercostal muscle layer is forming the pressure barrel of the thoracic cage in the first place so the intercostal muscles cattle grid are they always have tone so the intercostal muscles are always somewhat contracted somewhat firm so when you're breathing in even if you're sat there watching this video and you're breathing in with just your diaphragm uh, the skin doesn't get sucked in between the ribs and um, that wall is firm if if the muscles were flaccid or if you didn't have muscles there when you breathed in with your diaphragm then that change in pressure would pull the skin in between the ribs right so that would be really inefficient you pull your diaphragm down you wouldn't gain that a, a big increase in volume because you'd lose some of that increase in volume as the skin gets drawn in so the intercostal muscle layers between the ribs have tone they're firm and they form the pressure barrel of the thorax which makes it much more efficient when you move your diaphragm and you move your ribs and you change the the pressure within the thorax and the volume within the thorax and we see this in 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 patients with spinal cord injuries right getting close to the hill now so 39.25 so in patients with cervical spinal cord lesions who become paralyzed we see the muscles between the ribs uh, are paralyzed and when they breathe in that's exactly what we get we, we see this we see the the skin between the ribs indenting i think it's got a push harder <laughs> so when they breathe in the skin gets pulled in because the muscles are, haven't got tone after a few after a couple of weeks or a few weeks those muscles become spastics they become firm again so that's lost something else you might notice is when I'm breathing very deeply and you see this with cyclists on the telly with a side on view is that even these even though these guys are really skinny <laughs> 
when they're breathing hard going up big hills or going hard on the flat and bent over it looks like your, your stomach gets is much bigger than it really is so when you breathe down with the diaphragm of course everything in your abdomen has to get pushed down as well so when you're breathing really deeply when you're breathing really deeply everything gets pushed out so it looks like cyclists have had bellies when they're cycling bent over and breathing hard so the muscles of the abdominal wall have got to relax for you to be able to breathe in deeply So we're using the intercostal muscles and we're using the diaphragm to breathe with normal respiration when we're relaxed and with vigorous respiration when we need to breathe a bit harder. Um, but of course we've got to consider how do these movements of the thoracic cage translate to the movements of the lungs and for that we have the pleura so the pleura if you look at a lung the pleura is covered in a nice smooth shiny layer of connective tissue which completely encapsulates it it's quite thin and that layer of connective tissue is the visceral pleura and if you take the lungs out and you look inside the thoracic cage either side of the heart in the pleural cavities you see that the thoracic cage is lined with parietal pleura we've dropped the lorry and the movements of the thoracic cage move the parietal pleura and in between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura of the lung is no space really it's a, called a potential space and there's a little bit of fluid in there and what this means what this means is that the <laughs> what this means is that um, when the parietal pleura moves uh, the visceral pleura moves with it there is a negative pressure you might say in that space developed when the thoracic cage moves um, but I think like to think of it as two wet carrier bags so if you've got two wet carrier bags they're not actually stuck together they're just wet but when you pull one wet carrier bag the other one gets pulled with it right and you can pull the two apart but if you just pull one wet carrier bag the other one goes with it um, just a little bit like that but also um, the fact that there's this potential space and no way for air to get into it means that when you move the thoracic cage you pull on the parietal pleura the parietal pleura pulls on the visceral pleura and you get this lovely friction free movement and the lungs get pulled with the movements of the rib cage and with the movements of the diaphragm and normally the lungs are quite happy and quite compliant and they fill with air to equalize the pressure between inside and outside and what have you so that's the pleura of course if you do put a hole in one of those layers of pleura or both then the lung being filled with elastic tissue uh, being filled with elastin will naturally try to shrink um, and it'll be allowed to do so because the negative pressure that builds up or within that potential space that pleural cavity that will become a, instead of being a potential space, it will be a real space and if air moves into that space then you have a pneumothorax if blood moves into that space then a haemothorax then it means that the lungs can shrink as small as they want to and that space will fill with air or blood or another fluid and that will mean that the visceral pleura and parietal pleura won't work together anymore so so when the movements of the rib cage move to try and put air into the lung the lung won't fill with air it'll stay small uh, which is bad but luckily each lung has its own 
separate sets of pleura which means that if one side is damaged the other side should still work. So we've talked about the diaphragm, we've talked a bit about the muscles of the abdomen, we've talked about the intercostal muscles and how the ribs move, dead crow, and um, there are other muscles that can also move the ribs. So when you start breathing really hard or when your other muscles are tired, oh, big descent. Go left to the bottom. when my muscles, or rather, when the intercostal muscles and my diaphragm aren't enough, or they're tired, or I need to breathe deeper, I can start using other muscles. Pretty much, I reckon, any muscles you find attached to the ribs can move the ribs. They probably don't normally move the ribs. Uh, a lot of the muscles are linked to the shoulder. Because the shoulder girdle, the upper limb, is hanging off the axial skeleton, so it's hanging from the vertebrae, it's attached to the rib cage, moves around the rib cage, things like that. And you'll find in patients who are struggling to breathe, so asthmatic patients. Uh, Patients with COPD, maybe, but other, yeah, patients who are, have uh, difficulty breathing. So, if you think about the asthma patient who has bronchoconstriction, it's harder for them to pull air through their airways, to pull air in and to push air out. So, they have to do more work. And they can recruit some of these other muscles. They can recruit some of these other muscles to help them breathe, which I'm probably going to do now that I've started on Kef and Brin, the big hill on the length of the Gower. So for example, when we look at the neck, we see the scalenes. The scalene muscles are running from the cervical vertebrae down to the first two ribs. And if you contract both of those on both sides, you could lift the whole rib cage, couldn't you? If you look at the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which attaches to the mastoid process to the clavicle and to the manubrium sternum. If you can track those on both sides, that'll lift the sternum upwards, helping with that pump handle movement. Me, I'm cycling, uh, I'm sat down, I'm holding onto my bars, which means I'm not moving my upper limb. So the muscles the move between, the run between the upper limb, say the scapula or the clavicle and the rib cage that I might normally use to move my upper rim, limb, because my upper limb is fixed, I can use those to lift the ribs up. Big example is serratus anterior. Serratus anterior is a muscle that appears serrated because it has slips of muscle inserting into the ribs and it comes from the clavicle, oh, sorry, comes from the scapula. So normally it'll pull the scapula around the body. Boxers use this when they're reaching forward with a punch. But since my scapula isn't moving, if I contract my serratus anterior now, which I am doing, it lifts all my ribs up and backwards and outwards and it's helping me breathe in deeply and it's a big muscle it's very helpful we've also got pectoralis minor under here 
Oh, what a view. And Pex Rodis Minor runs from the ribs to the tip of the shoulders, pull the shoulder down. My shoulder is fixed. I could use that muscle to lift the ribs up. Posteriorly around the back, if there's a straightest anterior, then there's a straightest posterior, and there are in fact straightest posterior superior and straightest posterior inferior. And they're quite deep muscles, but they run between the vertebrae and the ribs. Straightest posterior superior will help lift the ribs up, help with inspiration. Serratus posterior inferior will help pull the ribs down, help with expiration. If you find any other muscles attached to the ribs, look at their normal action and have a think. Could they also move the ribs? Probably can. So those are the, the accessory muscles of inspiration or the accessory muscles of respiration. Oh, wow. And they might be used in both vigorous and forced ventilation. Hey look, <laughs> I found a pump handle. Didn't actually know that was there, it was a complete fluke. There you go, yeah, go on in. It's <laughs> yeah, it's welded. But you can see how <laughs> pump handle lifts, yeah, you get, you get the point, pump handle. Like the sternum. <laughs> 